for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This tape is tape two of five tapes by Dr. Derek Prince on the theme of deliverance. This tape is on witchcraft, heresy, and false religions. Father, we thank you that we can come to you unitedly as your children in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We submit ourselves and we commit ourselves in this meeting into thy hand. We acknowledge our total dependence upon thee. Lord Jesus, you said, without me, ye can do nothing. And we accept that as being absolutely the truth. But we depend upon you, we depend upon your faithfulness, we depend upon the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that on the cross, you died and shed your blood on our behalf. You were buried and you rose again. The third day and you are ascended, glorified, exalted far above all principality and power and every name that is named. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto thee. And in that name of Jesus, that authoritative name, we now put this entire service into the hands of God. We bind every agent and every activity and every influence of Satan that the word of God may have free course and do its work in each heart and life. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Now this afternoon I'm continuing with this laboratory on the theme of deliverance and demonology. Yesterday I tried to give you a picture of human personality and the various areas which may be affected by the presence and activity of demons and how you may detect that presence and that activity and the conditions for being able to receive deliverance. This afternoon I want to deal with one specific area which is becoming more and more urgently needed here in the United States and all around the world. This is the area of false religion and the occult. The great threat to the United States today is not communism, it's witchcraft. And it is time that as Christians we face this openly, dealt with it in the light of the word of God and asserted the victory of Jesus Christ over it. Uh, there are three specific types of problem that I'm going to speak about. The first is one that really comes under the heading of witchcraft, but it's only recently that I myself realized what I was dealing with. Then I'm going to deal with what I call heresies, which are departures from the Christian faith, and then I'm going to deal with false religions, religions which do not profess to be Christian. But I want to begin by this special form of witchcraft, which is the domination of one person over another person or person. And it is amazing how common this is, and how often it is the root of a person's whole spiritual problem. God created every person a sovereign, independent will and agent. And God himself never invades the sovereignty of human will. God requires that we respect the sovereignty of each other's will and personality. And when one person dominates another person, that is always evil. But it is very common. Uh, it is common for a man to dominate his wife, and sometimes his wife and children. It is quite frequent that parents collectively dominate their children. But the commonest is for a woman, as a wife and mother, to dominate her husband and her children. This is amazingly common. Now, I call this witchcraft, and I mean exactly what I say. But in many cases, such a person has not the faintest idea that they are involved in witchcraft. And if you were to tell them, they would be shocked. Because I've encountered this spirit of witchcraft so often, in so many circumstances and situations, and often in people who profess to be Christians and have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and sometimes are leaders in Pentecostal churches and so on, I really had to seek the Lord. I said, Lord, is this right? 
do these really peop people really have the spirit of witchcraft? What is witchcraft? And I believe the Lord showed me this. Now this is what I believe. I believe the Lord gave me a definition of witchcraft. And it is this. Witchcraft is the attempt to control others and make them do what you want them to do by the use of any spirit which is not the Holy Spirit. I'll give you that once again. Witchcraft is the attempt to control others and make them do what you want them to do by the use of any spirit which is not the Holy Spirit. And let me go on to point out that if you have a spirit in your life which you can use, that is not the Holy Spirit. No one uses the Holy Spirit. He is God. Now I have spent many years amongst Pentecostal people. I do not say this to criticize, but I just say it as part of my background of experience. Frequently you will find in a Pentecostal assembly a woman of strong character and personality. Often she has a husband who tags along like the tail of a kite behind her who will seek to dominate the pastor, the board, and the church. And many times she'll do it by some kind of spiritual manifestation such as interpretation or prophecy. And yet that woman, though a Christian and baptized in the Holy Spirit, is actually exercising the power of witchcraft in that group. Now again, the same thing happens in the charismatic renewal amongst prayer groups. It is quite common for a lady, very often she's the Bible teacher, to establish an influence over the members of that group which amounts to witchcraft. They are dominated by her. There's another group, in fact I'll mention it by name, you may, may, may make me unpopular, called the Manifested Sons of God. Uh, we have a center of them in South Florida. And they bring people under the dominion of their prophetesses. Anything a person has to do in that group has, group has to have the approval and sanction of the prophetess. If they're to go to a meeting, if they're to cross the road, if they're to get married, they have to go to the prophetess. Well, those ladies are not prophetesses of the Lord. They are witches. There's another situation here in Georgia. And I have to be careful how I say it now. But there's a church, a Baptist church, where... When I was last there, and I've not been there for some time, the largest single expense item on the church budget was the long-distance phone call. Because every major decision and personal problem in that church was referred to a lady prophetess in the state of Oklahoma by long-distance phone. And that woman actually dominated that pastor and that church from Oklahoma. Now, there are people here who know exactly what I'm speaking about, and I could name them. I don't intend to do so. But there is a family in this area who came under this influence. The young man, the son of the family, was saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, newly married. And he was instructed that if he had any problems, he was to consult sister so-and-so in Oklahoma. So he had a foreign-made imported car that wasn't running very well. Now you may smile, but this is the literal truth. He phoned sister so-and-so and said, I'm having trouble with my car, what's the matter? And the lady said, and her practice is to flip the t pages of the Bible mentioning the name of Jesus and come up with an answer. The lady said, after a while, it's the engine. <laughs> now you might think that that was a safe get-out. But when the man finally checked the situation for himself, he discovered it was one of the wheels. Well, he abandoned faith in the whole total package deal. The bats and the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, everything. And when I came there, I had to try to convince that young man that that was not the real Pentecost, that was not the real baptism, that was not the real gifts of the Spirit. Later, in fact in April, in the CFO here, the mother of that family heard me preach on this, exactly as I'm preaching this afternoon came to me privately and said, Brother Prince, you've described the woman who dominates her husband and her children, gets them all doing what she wants them to do, runs the house. She said, you've described me. And she said, every member of my family is saved and baptized in the Spirit and our whole home is falling apart. We're on the verge of breaking up. And I said, that's because the spirit of witchcraft always breaks up home. And when she came for deliverance, it took two people 
to drive that spirit out of her. And she was saying, it hasn't left me, it's fastened in my spine, I can feel it there. I think the brother that helped me pray for her is here this afternoon. She was a good, moral woman. She'd never committed adultery. She loved her husband and her children, but she was destroying that family by the evil influence that she exercised over them in the name of doing good. She was deceived. She didn't realize. And I cannot tell you how many people I have had come to me for deliverance. And when I've counseled with them, got to the root of the problem, it's a dominating mother. There was a preacher, an Assembly of God evangelist, who came to me some years back, talked to me about his personal problems. He's a well-known evangelist, preached in Assemblies of God churches in all 50 states of the United States. And as he told me his problems and unfolded, I listened and we were having lunch together. Then we went back to his hotel room for a time of prayer. And when he finished telling me everything, I said, Brother, I have only one thing to go by and that is what you have told me. I have no other source of information. But if what you have told me is true, I have to tell you this, your mother is a witch. Now that isn't an easy thing to say to a person. His reply was, that's what my wife says. <laughs> and I said, your wife is right. Well, he asked me to pray for him, and I hadn't given him any specific instructions on deliverance. I got up, placed my hand on his shoulder, rebuked that spirit and had to dive for the waste paper basket. I just got there in time. He started bringing up long, slimy strings of stuff that came out of him. And this went on for maybe 30 minutes. I phoned him next day and asked him how he was doing. He said, fine, but he said, I feel as if I run a 12-mile race. Every bone in my body is aching. I said, I can understand that. That's the physical exertion of deliverance. Then he said, and this was very interesting, he said, you remember that yesterday we ate chicken together? And I said, yes. And he said, then we went back to the hotel room, you prayed for me, and I brought up all that stuff. But he said, you know what? There wasn't a piece of chicken in what I brought up. And he said, it didn't come from the place where the chicken went to. And that was a, quite a revelation to me. See, there's another area inside you, which is the area where the spirits live. It's not your stomach. But when you get delivered, a lot of things sometimes come out of it. Then this man said to me over the phone, he said, um, we have a problem with our daughter. She's 13 years old. She's totally rebellious. She goes out and stays out all night, spends the night with men, is experimenting with drugs, and of course is a student in a well-known full gospel high, high, uh, high school. So she, he said, do you have anything you advise? Well, I said, I would suggest that when you get home, you talk it over with your wife, Pray through, and when you really have the anointing of God upon you and are strong in faith, take some item of clothing or other piece of something that belongs to that girl, lay hands on it, and rebuke the demon. So I said, all right, and he disappeared, and I didn't contact him for another year. Then he phoned me, and he said, he's back in town, so on. And he said, you want to know what happened? I said, yes, I do. Well, he said, we took an old blue T-shirt that our daughter loved, and always wanted to wear, without her knowing it, we prayed, laid hands on it, rebuked the evil spirit. Said that was a year ago. Our, sis, our daughter is now enrolled in an Episcopal girls' boarding school where they gave her a full scholarship, which is almost unique. She's getting A grades in every subject, and she's a model-behaved young lady. Then he said, there's something more I'd like to tell you. One day after this happened, my mother, the girl's grandmother, came to the home and offered to do something she never offered to do as a rule, to do the laundry. And in the various items that she washed was the girl's blue t-shirt. And he said, I want to tell you, since my mother washed that shirt, she's been a different woman. <laughs> now that, as far as I can give it to you, is a factual record of cases that have actually happened that I have dealt with personally and I can give you the name of every person involved. So you see, there's an area which is the source of many family problems. It's the dominating mother. Sometimes it's the grandmother. And that woman controls the destiny of her family. 
and her sons grow up still tied by an invisible umbilical cord to their mother. And they never develop into full-scale, total human personalities as God intended them to be. You can never be what God desires you to be while you're being dominated by the spirit of another person. God requires every person to be a sovereign, free, independent agent. Many, many times a man will dominate his wife. Many, many women come to me for counseling. I have to tell them, you just have to decide whether you're going to let the Lord dominate you or your husband. Now, I'm perfectly well aware the scripture says that wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands. But I have to say there's a difference between submitting to your husband and submitting to the devil in your husband. You don't come to me afterwards and ask me to explain the difference because it's very refined and delicate. For instance, let me say this frankly, there are husbands who demand sexual perverse acts from their wives. Some of them are ministers. In my personal judgment, a woman does not need to and should never submit to that. Now that's the way I find it. Any woman that does will need deliverance. This is, I say this on the basis of experience. All right, we've dealt with that area. Now, if you have been that dominating type of person, man or woman, you better check on your motives and the spirit that operates through you. Now, you might not be just as good as you think you are. You may be the local lady prophetess and a witch at the same time. This is not popular, particularly not with the local lady prophetesses. <laughs> but it just happens to be true. Actually, I'm going to go a step further. I respect women and I respect their ministry. And I've never been an anti-woman preacher. But I believe that there are things that God has tolerated in the past he's not prepared to tolerate any longer. And one of them is a woman exercising pastoral leadership over a group of people. Now I believe a woman has many legitimate ministries. She can be a prophetess, she can be an evangelist. But when it comes to a woman exercising the teaching and pastoral ministry as far as I'm concerned that's in the past. Oh, I know God has used women in the past, but what he's done in the past is not necessarily justification for doing it now. Because we have been in an awful mess, all of us, and we're on our way out. But praise God, let's keep moving in the right direction. Now, I am not anti-woman. That never has been my problem. If anything, that's been the opposite. And I say it without any kind of animosity or bitterness. I just say it because I believe the time has come to say it. Now let's deal with the subject of heresies. Heresies are departures from the Christian faith. Let's look in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the times in which we are living... Some shall depart from the faith. Now the faith is Christianity. There's no doubt about that. And here it speaks about people who depart from the faith. Now you cannot depart from Rock Eagle 4-H camp if you've never been there. That's logic. You cannot depart from the Christian faith if you've never been in it. These are people who've been in the Christian faith and thereafter depart from it. And the influence that causes them to do that is described. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. The correct word is demons, not devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. The Greek makes it clear it's the demons that speak lies in hypocrisy. It's the demons that have their consciences seared with a hot iron. And these false religious spirits entice people into error and deception away from the truth of the gospel which they have been believing. Of all the problems that we deal with, religion is the most tricky and the most dangerous. I am convinced that for every person who has been deceived and led astray by the devil, by some other means, at least ten persons have been deceived and led astray by religion. It is the devil's main instrument to deceive and to destroy the human race. The fact that you're religious doesn't mean that you're not a prey of the devil. We had a case this afternoon of a young girl who had been a worshipper of Satan for three years. Came for deliverance. She told us that she'd already been through deliverance once in a certain camp, not a CFO camp, but that it had come back. So we prayed with her and it was a somewhat 
hectic uh, experience and many of these spirits came out. She was very violent for a time and then subsided. And then there came out of her mouth this statement, she is free. The Lord has set her free. Uh, the Lord is coming soon. Be ready. And I thought to myself, was that God? And I looked in her eyes and it was anything but the truth and light of God that was in those eyes. And I realized that the devil was trying to keep a toehold by putting up a religious front. And it transpired that this was what had happened in the other camp. She'd come this far in deliverance and herself given forth a prophecy that she was free. And they said, praise the Lord, she's free. But you know what it was? It was a false prophecy. And uh, the three of us that were working with this girl, we each of us felt this is phony, it's false. And we attacked that demon of deception and false prophecy and commanded it to come out and it came out protesting, screaming. So you see, <coughs> the fact that a person prophesies doesn't always mean that it's the right thing. This is where you've really got to be on your guard. It's when you get into this realm that things become really exciting. <laughs> it is possible for people that have known the truth, been in the faith, to be led astray by spirits that seduce them from their loyalty to Jesus Christ and deceive them by teachings that are not in line with the word of God. Doctrines of demons. Now the Apostle Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 2. The second epistle of Peter, chapter 2. In the first chapter, Peter has spoken about true prophecy and true prophets. And he said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But in the second chapter, Peter goes on to warn the Christians that not only will there be true prophets, but there will be false prophets and false teachers. But there were false prophets also among the people, that is Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privily means in a sneaky, underhand way, shall bring in damnable heresies. Now the word heresy means literally to choose. And heresy means you choose what you will believe. Every heresy believes some part of the Bible. But the essence of heresy is choosing what you will believe and rejecting other parts. And there are heresies which are damnable. In other words, they cost you the salvation of your soul. If you embrace and believe these heresies, you will be a lost soul forever. Unless you repent, deliver yourself from the snare of the devil. Now, Apostle Peter goes on to describe the nature of damnable heresy. Even denying the Lord who bought them and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, we will not go on with the rest, although it's all very relevant. It speaks about how they will operate, how they'll use great, beautiful, long theological phrases and language and talk in a very high spiritual fashion and deceive many, many people and shall bring reproach upon the truth of the gospel by their evil practices. And all this we see happening in many areas of the United States today. People who, under the influence of prophecy and false doctrines, forsake their own wives, take off with somebody else's wife, travel across the country preaching, serving as an apostle, yet traveling with another man's wife all the time. Just recently, a whole group of young people were led astray by teaching that a man didn't have to stay with his wife or be faithful to his wife, go off and do what he pleased. These are damnable heresies. All these people will quote scripture by the yard, believe me. Don't believe everybody that quotes the Bible. The essence of the damnable heresy is contained in the words denying the Lord who bought them. Damnable heresy denies the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. Now I'll tell you what I believe about Jesus and you check if you agree. I believe that Jesus is God. He's divine. Secondly, I believe, and I'm a good Episcopalian, Roman Catholic or Presbyterian. In fact, this is essentially the Apostles' Creed that I'm giving you. And I doubt whether the Apostles' Creed was meant to be repeated every Sunday. I believe it was just the kind of confession that I give people when they come for deliverance. And I can say every word of the Apostle and the Nicene Creed and say Amen at the end. Can you do that? A lot of Episcopalians say it, but they don't believe it. And Catholics and others too. 
Now listen, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that he was born of a virgin by a supernatural, miraculous birth. I believe he led a sinless life. I believe he died an atoning death. I believe he rose physically from the dead the third day. I believe he ascended physically into heaven and I believe he's coming again physically just the same way that he went. Now if you can say amen to that, praise the Lord. But if there's anything in that what I stated that you cannot say amen to with your whole heart, you better check. Because anything that denies any of those truths and facts about the Lord Jesus Christ is a damnable heresy. And you will have to acknowledge that the main propagators of these damnable heresies are the products of the seminaries of the United States. Now, this is not a matter of dispute, it's obvious. They are the sources above all others, of false teaching, deceptive doctrine. They are the ones who most dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't the world that dishonors Jesus, it's the professing church. All right, let's turn on to the first epistle of John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. Now we're dealing with a specific spirit which is called the spirit of Antichrist. This also is very, very prevalent in our day. I'm going to read from verse 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Notice this is one of the marks of the last time is many Antichrists. They went out from us. Notice that. They started in connection with the Christian church. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. I have to tell you frankly, every time I read that verse, I think of Bishop Pike. This is not to be unpleasant or controversial. It just seems to me that he's such a clear example. He started as a keen Christian upholding the doctrines, the Christian faith and the Episcopal Church. But he was led astray by seducing spirits and had very much the same type of death as King Saul in the book of First Samuel. And that's no accident. In fact, it's cause and effect. Verse 20, But ye have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Notice the mark of Antichrist is not to deny God, but it's to deny the Father and the Son. To deny the relationship of the fatherhood and the sonship within the Godhead. The Antichrist will claim to be God. He will not deny God. What he'll deny is the person of the Father and the person of the Son. And if you deny the sonship of Jesus, then you deny the fatherhood of God the Father. This is the mark of the spirit of Antichrist. Going on to the fourth chapter, John returns to the same theme. Verses 1 and 2 and 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Notice a false prophet is one who has a false spirit. So when a prophet comes to your prayer group or church, try the spirit in that prophet. Because there are many false prophets operating amongst the charismatic prayer groups and amongst the full gospel churches and elsewhere. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I prefer to translate it this way. Jesus the Messiah has come in the flesh. Now, any spirit that denies, the next verse tells us, that Jesus, the Messiah, has come in the flesh, is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if you deny that Jesus is born of a virgin, you necessarily deny that he is the Messiah. So, to deny the virgin birth is to deny his Messiahship and is the product of the spirit of Antichrist. And then in the second epistle of John, the seventh verse, we have a further mark of this spirit. The second epistle of John, the seventh verse. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. 
Now that's a mistranslation. What it says is that they confess not that Jesus is coming in the flesh. They refuse to accept the personal return of the Lord Jesus in his body. This also is a mark of the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist starts in association with the true church, but goes out from it. It denies the person of the Son and therefore the person of the Father within the Godhead. It denies that Jesus is the Messiah and that he has come in the flesh. And it denies that he's coming again in the flesh the way he came the first time. Now when I make those four statements, if you are in contact with the same sort of situation that I am, you will realize clearly that you are in contact frequently with the spirit of Antichrist. It is seeking to invade the church of Jesus Christ. The word anti has two meanings. It means first of all against and secondly in place of. And this is the operation of the spirit of Antichrist. First of all, it is against Jesus, the true Christ, to remove him from the church. Secondly, it's going to replace him by the false Christ. But it has to get the true Christ out of the way first. Now this is the main operation of the spirit of Antichrist at the moment, is to get the true Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, out of the church. Now, I'm not attacking any group, but I have friends who are Methodists who said to me a little while ago, they said, Brother Prince, in our church, Jesus is a dirty word. You can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Plato, you can talk about Martin Luther King, that's all right, but don't talk about Jesus. That is the spirit of Antichrist. What the churches don't know is that when Jesus has been eliminated, there's another one going to take his place. And that will be the Antichrist. And he's already not far from the stage of human history. I would say his shadow already has fallen across the stage of human history. And he's not far behind his shadow. All right, now here we have dealt with heresies, departures from the Christian faith. They all center around the person, the nature and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All demons hate Jesus. All demons in one way or another will seek to detract from the honor, the glory, the divinity, the majesty and the authority of Jesus Christ. And anything that assails those is demonic. All right, now we come to the other area, which is the area of false religions. Religions that do not claim in any way to be Christian. John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now those words are categorical, explicit. There is only one way to God the Father. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross. There are many routes into the supernatural spiritual realm, but there's only one route that leads to the realm of God. And that route, that way, is Jesus Christ. Now, many other routes that people take get them into the supernatural realm, but it's the realm of Satan. Remember this, there are only two sources of supernatural power, either God or Satan. Supernatural power that does not come from God does come from Satan. If it comes from God, it will come through Jesus Christ. If you can get into the supernatural realm by a way that is not Jesus Christ, you've got into the supernatural realm of Satan. There are many, many such ways. In a little while, I'll speak about a few of them briefly. Now, I know this from experience because I went there. I was a practicing yogi. And by that means, I did get into the supernatural realm. But I got into the realm of Satan. And when I wanted to come to Jesus Christ, the greatest single barrier between Christ and me was the practice of yoga. And only by divine supernatural intervention and deliverance was I able to come to Jesus Christ out of that prison of Satan. Now don't tell me theories because I have facts. Let us also look in Ephesians 2.18 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. For through him that is Jesus Christ, we both, that is Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Would you notice that? There's only one Spirit that gives access to the Father. 
That's the Holy Spirit when you come by him, Jesus Christ. Many other spirits operate, deceiving spirits, spirits of mediums, spirits of divination, spirits of witchcraft, spirits of error. They claim to bring you into the realm of God, but they are deceivers. They're contrary to the scripture. There's only one spirit that gives you access to God. Now, before we go any further, I want to give you some definition. Because the King James English is somewhat antiquated. And I want to take the words used in the King James and give their modern equivalents in this realm of the satanic supernatural. If you want to jot them down with a pencil, you can do so. Divination, the modern equivalent, fortune telling. The word observer of times, or in one place, monthly prognosticator, that's in Isaiah 47. The modern equivalent, who can tell me? Horoscopes. Good. Astrologer or stargazer, the modern equivalent, astrology. Having a familiar spirit, the modern equivalent, a medium. Necromancy, consulting the dead. A charmer, one who uses charms. An enchanter, one who uses incantations, music, in any form to produce supernatural results. A wizard is male. And a witch is female. You know why we have so many more witches than wizards? Because essentially it's rebellion. It's the woman getting out of her position, becoming the teacher, asserting her authority. And rebellion and witchcraft are twins. Samuel told Saul when he went away from God, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Wherever you find witchcraft, you always find rebellion. And rebellion, in turn, opens the way for witchcraft. Now, let me go a little further with this. Divination, which is one of the main terms, or in modern English, fortune-telling, operates by revelations, dreams, visions, by predictions, foretelling the future, and by what is commonly called today ESP, extrasensory perception. That's divination. Witchcraft, operates by spells, curses, and in modern English, hypnosis. Sorcery operates by charms, music, dancing, and drugs. The whole drug cult is a manifestation of sorcery. It's not new, very, very old. Across Africa and Asia for many, many, many centuries, the witch doctor has known the type of herb or plant that would produce a supernatural spiritual condition and he charged a lot for the use of it just like the drug pusher today the drug pusher is just the direct descendant of the witch doctor and let me point out that music is often a powerful instrument of Satan many types of music that are popular amongst young people today when they go in for them and open up to them and yield their body to them they are exposing themselves deliberately or unconsciously to evil spirits. You see, again, this is all familiar in Africa. Why do they have war dances? Why do the people work themselves up into a frenzy and dance and leap and jump? Because they're deliberately trying to open up to the evil spirits so that they'll have more than natural power when they go out to war against their enemies. Now, let me also add that the people of God have got a right to jump and dance. It just depends which spirit is making you do it. And I'm rather careful myself that I know I'm in tune with the right spirit before I start. Now, let me give you some names of the commonest forms in which we find these things in modern America today. We find them in these, and, and the, the, the list is endless. I mean, I'm just giving some of the more common, familiar, and recent manifestations. Number one, the Ouija board. Without a doubt, number one snare of Satan for young people today is the Ouija board. I find at least 50% of the children that I deal with have experimented with the Ouija board. Fortune telling, drugs, including medical sedation, pep tablets and painkillers in many cases. People are addicted frequently to medical drugs. I have to say that I think in some respect the medical profession has a share of the responsibility for the drug cult today. Mediums, clairvoyance, quote, meditation, 
common door to Satan's power. You be careful when you start meditating that you're under the blood of Jesus and your mind has already been cleansed by the word of God. But otherwise, when you meditate, you'll open up to the wrong spirit, the wrong voice, the wrong direction. Oriental cults and philosophies, let me specify particularly yoga and all teachings that incorporate reincarnation, which is a satanic lie. Hebrews 10, 27, 9, 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, not reincarnation, but judgment. That's an unpleasant word for the reincarnationist. You'll never hear a reincarnationist talk about God's judgment. Astrology, horoscopes, hypnosis, which is a, a real example of one person dominating another. Automatic writing and graphoanalysis or handwriting analysis. Now there are many, many others, but it's not my purpose to go into a detailed list. Now let's go back in the light of this to what the Bible teaches. Let's go to the Old Testament for a moment. Exodus chapter 20, verses 2, 3, and 4. Part of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation <coughs> of them that hate me. Now, a lot of people speak about the third and fourth generation suffering for the parents' sins, but I want to point out to you that you've got to take it in the context. The particular sin which brings the judgment of God upon the third and fourth generation is the sin of having another God before the true God. You must take it in its context. Now, the terrible danger of all these things that I'm speaking about is that when you go for supernatural help to any other source but the true God, the source from which you are seeking that help is your God you are then making another God before the true God. If you seek supernatural direction and revelation from the fortune teller, you are making the fortune teller and the devil behind her your God. And that and all these other forms of occult practices are liable to bring judgment not merely upon those who practice them, but upon the second, third and fourth generation. The responsibility for these things is terrible. Now, I do not say this to bring condemnation on anybody, but if you are practicing or involved in any of these things, renounce them right now, get clear from them, or know that you will bring problems on your children and their children and their children, and you'll be accountable. Or if previous generations in your family have been involved in these things, bear in mind that your full deliverance probably will not take place until you acknowledge the source of these problems, and deliberately, by the authority given you in the Word of God, loose yourself from that evil inheritance and bondage. I have proved this in experience many times. Turn on to Exodus 22 and verses 18 through 20. Exodus 22, verses 18, 19, and 20. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. He that sacrificeth unto any other god, save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. I want you to notice the company in which witchcraft is placed, see? It's placed side by side with having sex relationship with an animal and offering sacrifice to another god. It's in exactly the same category. And God has the same opinion of it. Turn on to the book of Deuteronomy. And here we have the most complete list. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 and following. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And then the abominations are listed. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That is, to offer their child as a living sacrifice by fire to a demon. Now in the same category, in the same verse, in the same breath, as offering your child as a living sacrifice by fire, notice the other things. Or, 
that uses divination, fortune telling, or an observer of times, horoscopes, or an enchanter, one who uses music, or a witch, or a charmer, one who uses charms, or a consultant with familiar spirits, one who seeks to a medium, or a wizard, the male form of a witch, or a necromancer, one who seeks to the dead. They're all put in exactly the same category with the people who offered their children by sacrifice in fire to a demon. That's God's estimation. And under the law of Moses, anyone who practiced any of those things was immediately put to death. That's what God thinks about it. We do not put people to death in the Christian dispensation, but God's estimate of it has not changed. Now, in the New Testament, I'm going to go rather quickly and just mention some cases. In Acts 8, you'll find that Philip went down to Samaria and preached. There was a great turning to God, and in Samaria there was a certain man named Simon who was called a sorcerer. In Africa, we'd call him the witch doctor. And it says he had used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one and had held them in bondage to himself. This is typical. A witch doctor in Africa can terrorize a whole village by his threats of supernatural power. And this man, Simon, had held the whole city of Samaria under his dominion and control by the practice of sorcery or witchcraft. Now, when the superior power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit came, Simon saw the results and he believed. I'm inclined to think he believed more with his head than with his heart, but this is a matter of opinion. He was baptized, he joined Philip, and worked with him, watching him preach. Then Peter and John came down to pray for these new converts that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Simon watched while Peter and John laid hands on the heads of the converts and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. And Simon said, now this is something. And he turned to Peter and he said, I'll give you money if you give me that power. I have various things to say about that. First of all, if Simon had been in many modern churches, being a shrewd judge of the value of things, he wouldn't have offered anything for what he saw happen when people lay hands on one another. Secondly, when you've been in that realm, it is hard to get completely clear. He believed with his hand, but Peter said, you're still in the gall of iniquity and the bond, gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Your heart is not right with God in this manner. And you know the most typical thing? Simon said, pray for me. One thing I've noticed about people that have been in the occult, they want somebody else to do all the work. Many people have said to me, Brother Prince, pray for me. I say, you pray for yourself. If you're not desperate, don't ask me to be desperate for you. We don't know what happened to Simon, but I have little faith that he ever got clear. It is not easy to escape when you've been an instrument of Satan. Many times I've prayed with people like that, and the devil has spoken and said, she's mine, I've got her, I'm not letting her go. And Satan actually views such persons as his legitimate prey and property. And he's extremely aggrieved to let them go. You will not escape from that type of practice or situation unless you are totally willing to turn your back on it, renounce it, hate it, and make an unreserved commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way out. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas were on the Isle of, of, of Cyprus preaching and there was a certain false prophet named Bar-Jesus when they wanted to come to the proconsul, the governor of the island, this false prophet resisted them. That's always the operation of these demons. They'll always resist the truth of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says, Paul turned on him and said, Thou child of the, en of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, how long wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? That's pretty strong language. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. That's the nature of the false prophet, the magician, the sorcerer, the witch, and so on. They are the children of the devil and the enemies of all righteousness. And they pervert the ways of the Lord. They resist the truth of the gospel. They resist the true operation and manifestation of the Holy Spirit and counterfeit it with something false. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were in the city of Philippi and a certain devil, the Greek says, a certain damsel, having a spirit, a python. Now the King James says, possessed with the spirit of divination. But the Greek says, having a spirit, a python. The name of the spirit was python. 
And that is the spirit of divination or fortune telling. Now the way that a python operates, as you probably know, is to coil itself around the body of its victim and crush it slowly to death. And in the original version of the book about Jean Dixon, she herself stated that she received the gift, which she called the gift of prophecy, when something like a serpent moved into the bed and coiled itself around her. She could not have said more plainly the true source and nature of her gift. A certain damsel having a spirit, a piper. And she followed the preachers of the gospel. Now I want you to notice, every word she said was true. She said, these men are the servants of the Most High God who show unto us the way of salvation. The devil can speak the truth when it suits him. The fact that a person speaks the truth and comes forth with a true revelation is no guarantee that that person is a true servant and prophet of God. I have a little book, and I hope it's on the table, called How to Judge Prophecy. And I'd like to recommend you, if you've not read it, to look at it, because it's essential. I cannot go into all the details, but one thing I want to say, a person may have a true revelation or make a true prediction and be a false prophet. If you haven't seen that, you're in danger. Every word that this girl said was true. She knew it supernaturally, but she got it from the devil. And it says, Paul was grieved and turned to the Spirit and said, I command thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he, the scripture says, came out of her. And the moment the Spirit left her, she no longer could divine or tell fortunes or any such thing. And the men who'd made a living out of her ability became angry because they saw their prophets were gone. There are many, many, many damsels and women with a spirit of divination in the United States. Probably not a few on this campground. That's the way it is. I am very wary about who lays hands on Brother Prince, believe me. Not a few ladies have come up and offered to pray for me. I say, thank you, but pray at a distance. And don't you let anybody impose on you. Oh, I've talked to many, many people. The Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man. And that means lay hands, don't have hands laid on you suddenly by any man either. I don't want to come under the dominion of any of these wandering witches. It's a strange thing. There's a kind of private war between the spirit of witchcraft and me. I can recognize it almost anywhere. I see it in the meeting many times. And it, it gets real mad when it sees me. <laughs> However, I take that as a compliment. Galatians 3.1, let's look at that for a moment. Galatians 3.1 O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? you? Ever read that? Oh, but you say they weren't Christians. Read the next verse. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Not only were they Christians, they'd received the Holy Spirit. And they were bewitched. You know how it was expressed? You turn to the fourth chapter, 9 and 10. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? But the RSV says, elemental spirits, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. You're back in the horoscopes, back in the clairvoyance. Back in Jean Dixon and Edgar Cayce. Does that happen? It certainly does happen. There are many, many charismatics who've got one foot in God's camp and one foot in the devil. They are bewitched. I took over a congregation as pastor once. They were bewitched. This is what opened my eyes to this fact. The whole congregation was bewitched. You know by whom? By the wife of the previous pastor. She had become enamored of a board member. And they did something I recommend ladies never to do. Spend hours together in intimate personal counseling. Ladies, I advise you never counsel a man alone. And men, never counsel a lady alone. If you want to be saint. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. Not just abstain from evil, but abstain from evil appearance. Well, the inevitable happened. They became bound by one another. The board member divorced his wife. The pastor's wife divorced her husband. And they married. Now you would say you couldn't do that and get away with it in a full gospel church. She did. She got a large section of the congregation believing that what she did was all right. You know how she did it? She bewitched them. Those people were like birds 
mesmerized by a snake. If ever I came into a difficult situation, that was it. If my wife and I were not pretty tough people, we'd have gone under, I'll tell you. But thank God, as Bob Mumford says, it may look like a snake, but it's brave when you touch it. I've learned more from that situation and all that happened there than I've learned in any other single situation of a corresponding duration. And no one can tell me that spirit-baptized Christians cannot become bewitched because I know they can and the Bible says they can. After they've received the baptism, they can become bewitched. I'm not saying they need to, but I'm saying it can happen. And the lady that goes around, the prayer groups, dominating people. Now, sister, I don't see that for you. This pastor's wife, she used to counsel the young people. They would have an, a desire to go to college. She said, no, I don't see college for you. Not for you. Well, don't let anybody run your life. You know, If you're under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he's fully capable of running your life. He doesn't need the help of the local lady prophetess. You know why I'm not always popular now, don't you? <laughs> One reason why, not the only reason. All right. Let me show you 2 Timothy chapter 3. I, I must come to an end. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, glory to God. I don't know whether you people have ever read this third chapter because it's remarkable. Let me read the first verses of it. This know also that in the last times, perilous, last days, perilous times shall come. Now we're living in the last days. We believe that, don't you? I do. All right. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Isn't that awful? But you know the most awful thing is the next verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These are not people who are not members of churches. They're good church members. But they just don't want the power of God. The truth of the gospel, the truth about the blood of Jesus, the truth about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, they don't want it. And what does the Bible say? Stay in your church. Is that what you read? From such, turn away. That doesn't sound like stay in your church, does it? Now, you do what you believe right, but I don't read that in the Bible. <laughs> I read from such, turn away. What makes your church your church, anyhow? That's a good question. You stop and think that one out one day. Did you buy it? Did you build it? You're probably building it and buying it by stages. Now listen, we haven't finished. Come on, verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and take captive silly women laden with sins. There's a lot of silly women laden with sins around that are just waiting to get taken captive. These silly women, now this is Paul preaching, not me. <laughs> are led away with divers lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are some people who always want to know, but never get to know. You know that? Because when they get to know the truth, it's going to mean they've got to change the way they live. And that's just what they're afraid of. Okay. Now... As Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs the folly of Jannes and Jambres was. Now Jannes and Jambres were the magicians of Egypt who withstood Moses. Let me read one more verse and I'll show you the meaning. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers, but the Greek says magicians, shall grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. At the close of this age, there's going to be an ever-increasingly open manifestation of satanic supernatural power cultivated as such. And the final clash is going to be between the power of Satan and the power of God and the Bible takes us back to the deliverance of Israel out of Moses. The deliverance of Israel out of Egypt by Moses. And remember this, God sent Moses back to Israel with three supernatural signs. Said, you perform these signs. The first one was, throw your rod on the ground, it'll become a snake. Pick it up again, it'll become a rod. What's the use of doing that? 
The second one was, put your hand in your bosom. Pull it out, it'll be leprous. Put it in again, it'll be completely clean. The third one was, if they don't believe those two signs, take the water of the river, pour it out in front of them, it'll become blood. What's the use of doing any of those three things? Have you ever stopped to consider? But you see, God operates in the supernatural. And every messenger that God has ever sent by divine revelation, he has always given supernatural attestation to. All right, Moses came back, and God said, don't fail to do the sign. So he came along, he threw down his rod, became a snake. You'd think that would convince Pharaoh. Not so. Pharaoh sent for the magicians, said, what about that, boys? And they said, we can do that too. They threw down their rods, and they became snakes. Do you believe that? Well, it says so. But there was one difference. Moses' snake ate up the snakes of the magicians. All right. Moses said, well... I'll call, I'll pour the water out, it'll become blood. He did. Moses said, uh, Pharaoh said to the, Egypt, uh, to the magicians, what about it? They said, we can do that. They did. All right. God said to Moses, call the frogs out of the river. And they came out of the river, filled the houses of the Egyptians. Pharaoh said to the magicians, what about it? They said, we can do that. And did it. Listen, they could do three supernatural signs the same as Moses. They could turn their rods into snakes. They could turn the water into blood. They could get the frogs out into the houses. Then God said to Moses, Smite the dust with thy rod and it will become lice on man and beast. He did so. Pharaoh said to the magicians, What about it? They tried and couldn't do it. Then they said, This is the finger of God. Now the Bible says at the close of this age, the contest will be the same. As those magicians resisted Moses, so Satan's supernaturally empowered servants will resist the truth of the gospel at the close of this age. The clash will be in the supernatural realm. And a church that is not equipped to operate in the supernatural simply will not be with it when the time comes. We are specifically warned in Scripture there will be a tremendous increase of the deliberate open cultivation and manifestation of satanic supernatural power. We have to be ready for it. Okay, we've dealt with this as thoroughly as we can and rather too long. Now, how do you get straight if you've been crooked? If you've been in this area, if you've trespassed on Satan's territory, if you've become involved in the occult or heresy or witchcraft in any form, or if you've been a witch, and I don't need to go into the various possible ways of being a witch because I've done that, how do you get free? This is the climax of this. First of all, you have to confess. You have to confess your sin. God, I confess as a sin that 15 years ago I went to the fortune teller and sought for supernatural help from a servant of Satan which I should sought only from God. I played with the Ouija board. Oh, I only did it for fun. You know what Dennis Bennett says about that? It's like counting the teeth in a tiger for fun. It isn't fun. Do you commit adultery for fun? If you did it, you did it. Fun or no fun, ignorance or no ignorance, you did it. Confess it. Secondly, you must renounce it. You must renounce it. It's better to renounce it openly. There's a brother here in the camp. I don't know whether he's here, but he will remember. There, I can see him right now. I hope he's remembered. I'm going to try and tell this accurately. He came to me and he said, I'm baptized in the Spirit, but... <laughs> you know what the but means. Trunkless elephant. I don't speak in tongues. Well, he said, I speak in tongues just a little. I can see him smiling. I think he remembers. I said to him, I trust this is an accurate record of a conversation. Did you ever go to a fortune teller? Oh, he said, once when I was a boy, but I only did it for fun. But I said, you went. He said, yes. I said, would you renounce it in front of me with me as your witness? I led him in a brief renunciation. I said, now pray. And he prayed in tongues like a machine gun. <laughs> the barrier had been removed. Many, many people come to me and they say, Brother Prince, I'm baptized in the Spirit, I want to serve the Lord, and when the Spirit is strongest in the meeting and I most long to worship God, something comes between me and God. You know what I say? Did you go to a fortune teller? And more than half the time, the answer is yes. There's a dark shadow from the past following you up. And the thing that manifests itself when the power of God in the meeting is strongest is nearly always demonic. It's the power of God that drives the demon out into the open. You have to confess it. I played with a Ouija board. I studied Jim Dixon. I've read the books of Edgar Cayce. 
I've experimented with ESP. Well, go on with the list. I don't need to do it. You name it as a sin specifically. Thirdly, having renounced it, you break all contact. And if you have any of these objects or books in your home, you go home and burn them. Not put them in the garbage, but burn them. A lady came to me yesterday. She said, somebody brought us a present of an image or some kind of statue from Haiti. And she went into the details of the problems that had arisen. She said, what shall I do with it? I said, she said, do you think we ought to get rid of it? I said, yes. She said, what will we do with it? I said, burn it. It took me precisely three words to tell her all she needed. Yes, burn it. And that's all you need. Yes, burn it. Buddha, images, Anything that dishonors the Lord Jesus Christ and uplifts the devil has no place in your home. A woman had a wonderful deliverance in the Arlington area, went on a holiday to Mexico, vacation, and bought some pictures of Mexican deities, returned home and was nearly killed in her bathtub by a demon. You know that? She said, what's gone wrong, Brother Prince? And as we sat and talked, I said, did you bring anything back from Mexico? She said, yes, I brought these pictures. I said, that's what's gone wrong. And she didn't keep them in the house that night. You cannot be friends with the devil and friends with God at the same time. Now, those of you that are not involved and have no need, you may feel free to leave. But those of you that have a need, you're bound, you're not fully free, you're involved as a dark shadow, you want to get deliverance, I'm going to minister to you right now. Would you bow in prayer? Now, those of you that say, Brother Prince, I'm here by divine appointment this afternoon. I need deliverance. I need to be clear. I need my household to be clear. I need my family to be clear. I need to renounce and be set free. And I mean to do it this afternoon. Would you raise your hand, wherever you may be? Praise God. All right. Every person that raised your hand, I would like you to stand up where you are in your seat. Now, it's up to you to be desperate and to be determined. And I'm going to lead you in a public confession of your faith in Jesus Christ and then in a confession and renunciation of every contact with Satan. When this is over, get it out. Loose yourself, whatever it may be. Now I'll pause in the middle and give you an opportunity to confess your particular involvement, whether it was the Ouija board, the fortune teller, whatever it may have been. Many, many different things. And be as specific as you can. Are you ready? I want you to say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead, that you're exalted at the right hand of the Father, and that you're coming again in person, in power and glory. I confess all my sins. I renounce all my sins. In particular, I confess that sin. Now put it in, whatever it was. Name it. Say it out loud before God. All right, now we're going to go on. Lord, I confess that I went to the devil. For help which I should have sought only from God. I confess this as a sin. I renounce that thing. If necessary, I will destroy it. I loose myself now. In the name of Jesus. From any satanic power. From any satanic dominion. And I command Satan to be cast out of me, my life, my family, my home, everything connected with me. I accept the Lordship of Jesus in every area of my life from this moment onwards in Jesus' name. Now, if there's anything needing to leave you, let it go now. Satan... You evil spirits of divination, witchcraft, sorcery, deception, heresy, error, I bind your power in the name of Jesus and I command you to come out of these people now 
in Jesus' name, come out. In the name of Jesus. Come out. In Jesus' name. Come out. In the name of Jesus. Come out. In the name of Jesus. Come out. In Jesus' name. Satan. You have to go. Witchcraft. Come out. In Jesus' name. Out you come. In the name of Jesus. Out. 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 In the name of Jesus. Out. In the name of Jesus. We have enough, we have enough people over here, we don't need more. That's all right. Just stay calm and mind your own business. You solve your problem. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com or LHBCOnline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.